So this is the final installment of the decorative uh, pet casket. If you've been following along, it's basically going to be the finishing touches that is involved in this video. Um, I feel like I've been talking about these caskets for the past, at this point, month. So this is going to be a pretty quick intro. As far as the plans go, I did finish up the plans for the first casket, which is a little bit more of a minimalistic, simplistic style. And um, those are posted now on the YouTube videos. Um, I believe the link takes you to Etsy because that was where I first posted them and you have to charge at least 20 cents to list something on Etsy but I do have those plans on my website and on Pinterest as well and on those outlets they are free. This one was a little more detailed so it's taking a little longer but I hope to have these up um, by the end of the weekend and then these two projects have been done for quite a while at this point and I'll be moving on to more customer-based projects uh, next week. So to start this video, I'm gonna start making the dog bones, which are gonna be on the corners of all the pieces. All I did was use a compass to draw some circles and then connect those with straight lines, and I rough cut these out on uh, the scroll saw. Now, if you're using the plans for this, the plans, I left the rough block material so that you have the measurements for the rough cutout, and then you could go through and carve them. So this is a very simple carving. I just drew a center mark down the, around the perimeter of the entire bone. I didn't measure anything, just kind of used a pencil. I'm using a medium uh, bit to remove that material. Now I know this is a DIY video, but in my experiences, most DIYers have some sort of Dremel or rotary tool that you can, you can carve with. You could power carve with those sorts of tools. And even though the bit I'm using is a little bit more of an expensive bit, you can use the cheaper Dremel style bits. They sell at Lowe's and stores like that in order to carve these. You just need one that's a little bit more abrasive to start with because it removes the material the fastest. And all I'm doing is I'm just creating a slight angle from the edge and feathering it to that center line. Super simple, that will give me my initial curve. So you can see I'm just working my way around. We could call it a 45 degree, but I'm just holding the, the bit at a rough angle and I'm removing the, keeping the center portion the same uh, dimension, but removing material from the edge until that bit starts to reach the center. Very simple feathering out the edges in order to get that rough shape. The nice thing about this sort of carving is you really can do this however you want. Some people might, might like the way it looks before it's carved. You could keep it square. Some people might li like the way it looks now. Then I'm switching down to a die grinding bit. This actually looks fairly abrasive, but it's it, it does smooth out the wood quite nicely. And I'm just gonna start taking some material off the center and turning the center more into a cylindrical or even an oval shape remove some of that squareness. At this point, the lines on the outside I'm no longer following, and I'm just feathering all of this material. It's a very simple process. I'm basically just taking those sharp edges and turning them into more of arches and curves. You can see it's just a series of feathering, light, light, light movements with the Dremel. I'm not applying a lot of pressure. So then at this point, I put that aside and I moved back to finishing up the, the casket. You could see I popped off the top. I just snipped off the brads that stuck out and then I could continue working on this base. I'm putting what I'm calling rope molding on the outside. This was the easiest one to cut because it was symmetrical. So I, could, I didn't have to worry about uh, flipping it or anything like that. You can see I started, the angles are going to be the same as the base for this and it's uh, covering the edge, but then it's also creating a lip on top, which will cover the plies that were left on the top of the piece. Now this is what I'm using. If you want to use something different or something thicker, that will work for you. I'm using this little scrap piece to kind of get all my angles right. And this is, I believe, three quarter inches thick. So once again, going over this, I'm using a bevel gauge to find my initial angle. This is actually a digital gauge and it will tell you what it is, but my batteries are dead. Transferring that to a piece of paper. So there's 45, dividing that by two, which gives you 22.5. I'm subtracting that's 22.5 from 90 and getting 67.5. See how I use the protractor to do that. That is the angle I'm going to be using. So I once again adjust. I have a couple bevels in the shop. 
adjust that to the bevel and then I could put that on the saw this is the wrong side flip it to the other side and that is the angle I'm cutting all of these pieces at so that's how I went about finding the measurements for this this top part to cut very simple now I could go through you could see how if I flip this upside down it's since it's symmetrical it's the same cut which made this one the easiest one to do could make my marks cut it to the edges you could see how I'm using this scrap to make sure it's the right length and then I could attach these all and then it's the same process as the base as well as the top I just worked my way around the top once again I'm putting brads in these at the bottom someone in the other video commented to start using a pin nailer because the brads aren't as noticeable which I might do in the future because that was my one big self critique of this project was how visible the brads were now I'm putting this at an angle to get into the material you can see one of those popped out at the end it's pretty simple I just snipped those off and sand it in order to get it to fit and then there is that rope molding around the top Now the other uh, reason I chilled these moldings was I knew I wasn't painting this or uh, I wasn't going to stain it either, but staining would work. So I want it to be somewhat of a uniform color. You can see how this lid now fits in the top, kind of nestles in there. So it's two separate pieces, but it almost looks like one piece. So I was pretty happy with how that fit in there. It doesn't look like it fits right here, but that's just because this one edge is, um, needs to be popped into place there it is and then that all fits so now I'm going to be putting um, an inner inner edge on all of it. now I'm going to be putting the the top on actually I skipped ahead so the top is going to be a raised panel I'm using the same three-quarter inch ply what I did for the whole piece you could see if you're cutting cupped lumber it leaves a little bit of a gap because you're cutting the cut the lumber at an angle when it's that cupped so all I did was cut it in half to remove the cup and then I just trimmed off the edges on the table saw so that they became more square. By doing this, this wasn't wide enough for the top. So I'm actually adding a piece of poplar in between the two. It will give it a nice little, uh, little bit of a stylized top as well with the difference in the, the lumber finish for poplar versus pine. So this is that pop, I always have poplar laying around the shop because I make all my face frames and cabinet doors out of poplar. And then I could just clamp this in place and let it set up overnight. So because I didn't plane, plane or joint these boards before, I, I glued them up into a panel. They are a little off. Um, and I used a belt sander to kind of level them out the next day. If you keep the panel like this in the clamps, you could see the, the difference in the material. If you keep the panel like this in the clamps, um, it's really easy to sand. And then I could just lay this, uh, the top of the box, the casket on top of the panel, sharpened a pencil till it was really low so it could fit under that lip. And I could just trace it. One edge I kept even with the end so that doesn't have to be trimmed down. And then there's the 45s on the edges. So I could just trim it down on the radial arm saw and then cut those angled corners with a handsaw. And then this is the rough panel for, for the top, which I'm going to turn into a raised panel. So that's what it looks like dry fit on the top. And then for the raised panel, I believe I cut the bevel at 12 degrees and I went up pretty much as high as the blade will go. So you could see it starts to smoke a little bit. This is a new blade. It's not dull. It's just I'm removing quite a bit of material at once. You can see I'm cutting both these long edges first with my tall fence, which makes it a much safer cut. And then for the, the long edges, you could actually clamp this in place with, with a guide on the top of the, the tall fence, go pretty slowly. At some point, this does get caught up on, the, on the, the zero clearance plate I have in there, which is why it really starts to smoke. But this was easy to sand up. And then there is the, the angles of the raised panel. I left about a sixteenth of an inch material there on the edges, so I did remove quite a bit. But then that's what it looks like with everything in place. There's a little bit of shadow creating what looks like a gap. And it's the bottom wasn't perfectly flat, which also is creating a little bit of a gap as well. So 
So the next up was I made uh, handles on the side of this that look like bacon. This casket is actually for my parents' dog, which is kind of my dog at this point. And she um, is 13, and she still has a lot of spunk left in her. But like I said, because I was already making a casket, I decided to make hers as well. She does have some health issues, but she, she loves uh, a bacon. So I kind of introduced that into the side of the casket. All I'm doing is taking some cherry and some pine, and I cut them down to about a quarter of an inch. I think it might have been five sixteenths. And then I cut them down to the same width, and then I use some double-sided tape in order to attach them uh, one on top of the other. So obviously the two different types of wood will create the two different tones for the bacon. You can see all I do is attach these and then all I did was rough draw some waves in the piece. I didn't measure this out or anything, just did it by eye. Drew two top waves and then two center waves, waves to kind of designate the meat mark versus the, the fatty part of the bacon. So I essentially have four waves going down this strip and then I'm going to trim that out on the scroll saw. Now this is a little thick for a scroll saw, but I don't have a band saw. And thinner material like this is kind of a pain to do with a jigsaw. So we did kind of suffer through sending this through the scroll saw. I'm just roughly following those, uh, those marks it does not have to be perfect. And you can see I'm essentially creating four different pieces at this point. And then I finish it up and then these these two center pieces come apart as well. So then I have my my four four essential waves at this point. All I'm going to do now is then disconnect these and then flop switch out the cherry with the uh, yellow pine for the centers. I'm going to create two pieces. Now the piece I'm using is going to be the cherry with the yellow pine in the center, but since I had the other one, I glued up both of these. So just a little bit of glue and I could tape them into place. This one with the two, the yellow pine on the edges, I'll end up using for something most likely down, down the line. And then I let this set up. Now this will eventually be cut in half. I'm, I built it in one big piece to save time. So then this inner frame is going to get another piece of quarter inch ply and that's going to be the lip that will rest in that original rabbit I cut all the way back in in part one. Now you don't really need this because this lid sits in the frame but I still did it because what it's going to do is cover up that that inner part. So once the raised panel is on this this will be nice and and sealed off. So I just dry fit these in place. I could put some brad nails through the angles I have holding up the crown. You could see it just finishes that off and then I could attach the raised panel with brads as well. And then um, once this is flipped upside down, it, uh, like I said, it just finish it, finishes off nicely. You won't see any of those ribs. To fill the brad holes, I'm using some glue and some sawdust around the shop to make my own wood putty. You mix it up till it's about the consistency of peanut butter. Um, I tried using Elmer's glue this time because it dries a little bit lighter than Tight Bond 3, but these these patches were still pretty visible. I keep saying it, but this was this was the one one part of this build I wasn't super happy with was the visibility of those brads. At this point, I switched gears back to the bacon. I, I uh, marked one inch quadrants on the whole thing, and that will be how I start to make the the top side waves. So you have a long vertical wave with those those. Uh, three three separate portions and then I'm going to create some top side waves. I have a, a rounded abrasive bit in my uh, rotary tool and I'm just going to go through and create peaks and valleys. Obviously every other quadrant is going to be a valley. So I'm just creating a valley and then as that valley gets deeper you can see I'm going to feather it up onto the peak so I get some nice rolling curves on the top side of this this bacon. Once I have that done I'll start rounding over the edges as well and I keep going until um, obviously this is not going to resemble realistic bacon neither, neither does the the dog bones but that wasn't really the look I was going for until it has enough dimension that I'm happy with it. So back to the dog bones, this was how they looked once I was done with the rotary tool. I 
And to finish these off, I just hand sanded them with 120 grit sandpaper. Sometimes sanding stuff by hand, especially stuff with curves, will give you the best results because your fingers can conform quite easily to those curves versus the rigidity of most tools. Same thing with the strip of bacon. I got it to the point I wanted it to with how much detail I wanted, and then I just hand sanded it to finish it off. To attach all these, I'm using, I believe they were, these were 5 16 inch dowels, so I just drilled a hole in the center of the piece and then the center of the bone, and then I could attach those with dowels. I believe the dowels were 2 inches. If you're following along on the plans, I don't think I have the dowel marks for the casket in place, just because it could vary quite a bit on where your placement might be based on what you end up putting in these corners. Because obviously you can customize this, which was kind of my ideal when I originally started. This is how I did it, but you can really fill these corners with anything you want. For the longer sides, I don't use a lot of wood applique or onlays in my work, but someone had given me a pack of these wooden appliques years ago at this point and I don't use them and they were about a quarter inch too wide to fit in this space. So all I did was trim off the ends of two of the leaves and they fit in here quite nicely. I like the way they looked so that's what I decided to use to finish that up. Now one of these was already stained which I wasn't in love with at the time but I actually didn't mind it in the end. So the other one I put a, a cherry stain on to get it to match. And then I like them not being set all the way back in shadow box. So underneath three of the widest portions, I put little blocks of wood. I marked where that wood was with a pencil, and then I just glued them in place on the box. I put brads through the, the wooden applique after I put the finish on it, and then that's how that all worked out. You can see how it now sits up and it creates some kind of nice shadows in there as well. So then to finish up the bacon, I also was going to put dowels in this and it wasn't thick enough. So I just put two scrap pieces of that three quarter inch pine on the back, glued it in place. And then I just trimmed off the edges. You can see I just marked the edges and trimmed these. I believe at the end of the day, these were about seven inches uh, long and a little over an inch and a half wide was the, the end dimensions. You can see that I'm just going to cut it in half and those are my two pieces. I have a doweling jig so I'm going to use that in order to drill the holes in the back so they're as square as possible. You can see I'm just going through and putting a series of holes. And then the layout for this is not super important because I'll use the holes in order to put the layout on the side. You can see I marked where the center of those holes are on, are on the side of that pine on the back. I could put it about where I want it on the box and then mark on the box where those holes are going to be. So once again, I don't have the circular holes in the build plans because this could is really dependent on what you decide to put in these boxes. So once those marks were there, I could transfer them to the center, which is why they're a little bit above the marks I have, drill some holes. And then once again, I believe I have about two inch dowels in there and then that just uh, attaches into place and that's how the handles will look. So for the finish on this I wanted to use something as organic as possible so I used boiled linseed oil which is a little different from raw linseed oil in that it has some additives to it so it dries a lot faster than raw linseed oil. Uh, boiled linseed oil is a derivative from the flax plant. The edible version of it will be flaxseed oil. So this is something that you could put in the ground without having to be too conscious about what exactly is on it versus a paint or a stain. So I covered everything with a couple coats of, of boiled linseed oil. Pretty simple. Any sort of oil application is like this. Put a liberal amount on, let it sink into the wood, remove the excess, and reapply multiple times. If you are a DIYer and this is your first time using boiled linseed oil, just be aware of the fact that it might be a little bit of overkill, but you do not want to throw a hump of the rags in the trash. They've been known to kind of spontaneously combust and cause some pretty nasty shop fires. So just be careful of how you dispose of those rags. Then to finish everything up, I just glued all the pieces into place once the, the oil was dry. And this is what the casket looks like once it's finished.